Great, thanks everyone. Um, and thank you everyone for, for joining us. Um, so I'm Rob Burley, I'm Director of Campaigns Care and Support here at Muscular Dystrophy UK. Um, and welcome to the first of our two online seminars that MD UK is holding this afternoon as we launch our Muscles Matter online seminar series, living with a muscle wasting condition in 2020 and beyond. In this series of 12 seminars between now and the end of October, we'll be exploring what it's like to live with a muscle wasting condition in these unprecedented times. And I think that's a phrase that's been used a fair bit over the last few months now. So six of the seminars are exploring specific conditions, and these will be aligned to awareness days, weeks and months that are taking place. And of course, we're speaking now um, just at the, at, the, at the tail end of um, SMA Awareness Month. Um, the remaining six seminars are looking at a range of topics relevant to anyone affected by muscle wasting conditions. And the full list of seminars should be on your screen now. And you can go to our website to, to book a place, including, um, I think we, we, we've got the ability to take some bookings for the second session this afternoon, which is exploring living in a world with um, COVID-19 <coughs> taking place directly after this one. We're very grateful to Sarepta for supporting the Muscles Matter online seminar series through their general sponsorship. MD UK is holding these seminars because for now we're unable to bring our community together um, through our information days, our family fun days, our national conferences and indeed our muscle groups. Um, our helpline though does remain available to anyone affected by muscle wasting addition so do please contact us if you have any questions or are in need of support. We can help you with information and provide direct support and if we can't support you directly we can signpost you to, to where you might be able to get that help. So that again, the number and email should be on your screen, um, but the number is 0800 652 6352. And the email address is info at musculodystrophyuk.org. So this first seminar is focused on spinal muscular atrophy, and we'll be exploring the latest developments in research into the condition and also um, discussing living with SMA. And that section will include um, looking at the latest news on access to treatments. Before we welcome our first panel, a note on how you can ask questions or make comments through, throughout the session, and I've seen some people are already um, um, doing that. So many of you have submitted questions in advance, and we'll seek to cover these um, as we go along. Um, but we'd also like to incorporate, incorporate some live input, and to do this, please use the Q&A function. So please type your question or comment, and we will feed them into the discussion. To help us manage the technical side of the event, we won't be calling on questioners to ask their questions directly. Um, any questions we don't manage to cover or that we don't know the answer to, we'll seek to respond to through our website afterwards. Um, and finally, a reminder that we are recording this session and that it will be made available um, in the next 24 hours. So to start us off this afternoon, um, I'd like to welcome MDUK's Director of Research and Innovation, Dr. Kate Adcock, who will introduce the research, the research section of this afternoon's seminar. Thanks, Kate. Super. Thank you very much, Rob. So um, without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce our two speakers. Um, the first is uh, Professor Laurent Seve from um, the University of Oxford, and the other speaker is Dr. Susan Hammond, also from the University of Oxford. So Professor Survey um, studied medicine and did his PhD in Brussels before moving on to the Institute of Myology in Paris, where he eventually became the, the head of the Institute of Muscle Oriented Translational Innovation, happily known as iMotion, which is easier to say. Um, since the um, autumn last year in September 2019, he has been a professor of paediatric neuromuscular diseases at the MD UK Oxford Neuromuscular Centre. He's also an um, invited professor of child neurology at Liège University. Laurent has um, been the lead in many clinical trials, both for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and for spinal muscular atrophy. And today he's going to be talking to us about um, clinical research in, in spinal muscular atrophy. And also after Laurent, we will have um, Dr. Susan Hammond, who is an academic researcher. She's also based at the MD UK Oxford Neuromuscular Centre. Susan got her PhD at the Northwestern University in Illinois and is now based in Oxford, where her team is focused on improving and designing new therapies for spinal muscular atrophy and muscular dystrophies such as Duchenne and myotonic dystrophy type 1. 
And Susan's going to talk to us today about her work on um, the MD UK funded project on treating the brain and spinal cord with antibody oligonucleotides. So we'll hear from um, Professor Survey and then to, from Dr. Hammond, and then there'll be an opportunity for them to answer questions. So do feel free to take advantage of the Q&A function in Zoom. And we'll try and answer as many questions as we possibly can. So Laurent, over to you. Thank, thank you, Kate. And, and first of all, um, two statements. Um, I want to thank MDUK for, for at first, uh, the, the, the help and, and the support and the instrumental position um, that, that you took in, in, in Oxford. Um, and the second, um, the second thing is also to welcome me um, in, in this seminar. My second statement is to congratulate you for, for the way you say Laurent, Liège, and Servet, which is highly unusual for an English-speaking person. So congratulations for, um, for this. Uh, uh, it's very strange for me to hear my name like this. Um, properly pronounced. <laughs> Congratulations. So um, now let's go, let's move seriously in the, um, in the presentation. I, I've been asked to speak to you today about um, what's next. Well, um, what's next in spinal muscular atrophy? We, we, we're living a super exciting period um, with three drugs that are approved nowadays by the FDA. Um, what's next? So uh, may I have next slide, please? <clears throat> I have a couple of disclosure. Um, next slide. Okay, so as I told you, um, today we, we have three drugs that are approved by the FDA, two that are uh, approved by, by EMA, New Nurse and, and, and Gene Therapy. I, I, I don't think that I should spend too much time on this. Uh, interestingly, there are other drugs in the pipelines. Um, and, and you probably know that um, a drug uh, from, uh, to move from, from a mouse, um, where it works beautifully, uh, to a drug that is approved in human, it takes about 10 to 15 years um, in average, um, with an attrition rate of, of about 24, which means that you need to enter 24 drugs um, in the pipeline to get one at the end of the pipeline. And uh, this pipeline is, is quite long. You, you first have to demonstrate in animal models um, that it works, but also that um, you um, understand the dose, that you understand the toxicity and the safety be before moving to phase one, in which you will try to um, evaluate the safety of the drug, then to phase two, to better understand the dose, and then the phase three, uh, to demonstrate the efficacy in humans. So it's, it's quite a long journey, let's say. And today, <clears throat> outside the drugs that are approved or, or nearly approved um, uh, in, in, in Europe for, for um, Riziplam, um, there are um, at least three other drugs um, that are um, in development. The first one is, is a neural medication uh, developed by Novartis, very close of, of Riziplam. And um, the name is, is also very difficult to, to um, remember, it's Branaplam, and you have to pronounce it with the accent from Basel. So it's, it, it makes, it's not Brennaplum, it's Brennaplum. Um, you have um, antimyostatin drugs, um, and, and there is a company that is called Scholarox in the US, which is currently um, um, uh, designing the, 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 the phase three trial. And um, you have drugs that, that, that works also on, on the filament um, and on the, on the, uh, on the actin um, um, filament, and which is um, the, and, and then be careful pro to pronunciation. Rel den I, I, I cannot do it. Um, it's even uh, easier to remember CK2127107. Uh, it's like, you know, the, the, the phone number of your grandmother. Next slide, please. So today, um, one of, of the main questions we, we may have is, uh, is it meaningful to, um, to give two drugs that work on the same target? Um, is it meaningful to give uh, Rizdiplam plus uh, gene therapy, gene therapy plus nucinersen? Um, and actually, we don't know. Um, and, and we will need a lot of time to know. Because it's a constant observation that actually there is no patient who has been treated today after the symptom and with normal, with symptom-free. Which means that 
um, whatever is treatment A that you are on, you will always ask the physician to push the envelope, uh, to go for the extra mile and to get an additional medication. Is it because it works better? Be basically, we don't know. Um, and, and probably the only way to know if a drug um, need to be added to another one will be with presymptomatic patients. So let's not even speak about drug association because we have a limited um, amount of time. Let's, let's speak about other target. And one of the target is certainly the muscle. The muscle um, is atrophic uh, and, and the muscle is denervated. What can we do when we have restore uh, and, and when the, the, the muscle can be um, properly innervated? Um, next slide, please. So one of the way is antimyostatin. So antimyostatin, um, myostatin is, is um, as you know, a drug that, that, that is, a, is a pathway um, that helps to control muscle mass and you can inhibit this pathway. Um, the, the, the beauty of this approach is that nature thought about it long before we did. Um, and that's why actually in, in all patients with neuromuscular disease, um, myostatin is, is very low. Um, and so what, what has been observed in patients um, as well as in mice, is that when you treat mice or patients, um, myostatin level increase, opening the, 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 the window, the therapeutic window um, for another approach, which is muscle directed. May I have next slide, please? So don't think about antimyostatin as a first line therapy, but much more as an add-on therapy. And, and this uh, very um, beautiful paper from, from the team of Gosh um, has shown that indeed um, in the mouse model of, of, let's call it SMA type three, which means um, mice that are um, not completely cured or treated by um, morpholinos, um, then um, you can add um, myostatin inhibition. Next slide. And um, getting um, better strength. Um, next slide. And uh, better uh, weight take um, and, and better survival. Um, of course, this is only meaningful in, in, in mice who have been, uh, which, have, which have been treated before um, with uh, uh, SMN directed uh, therapy. And we know in humans that, that myostatin level is very low in patients who are untreated, but that it increases in patients who have been on Lucinersen or another disease modifying treatment for, for some months. Next slide. Another approach that works immediately on, on muscle is uh, um, the Heldensemtiv, um, which is actually um, a troponin um, activator. Um, and uh, it has been tested in a phase two double blind randomized placebo control study. Next slide. Uh, so that, that's um, actually the the, uh, the 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 way uh, the, the place where where this drug fits um, on the troponin. Next next slide. And um, there is um, strong rational um, from the animal models that, that it can increase the the strength of of uh, mice um, mice model um, with SMA on a dose dependent manner. Next slide. And so it, it gave rise to a, um, a phase two study uh, that, that evaluated two different doses, 150 mix and 450 mix in um, ambulant and non-ambulant patients. It was a double blind randomized placebo control study. So um, quite a high level of, of uh, uh, evidence um, that can be achieved um, through this kind of approach. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> what, what, what was observed is that, um, of course, the, this is, you know, small um, cohorts, it's 18 patients. Nevertheless, on, on the six minute walking test um, in ambulant patients, uh, it was not far away. The difference between treated and untreated patients was not far away um, of the uh, statistical significance, 0.05. Um, and um, this uh, was even more true for patients on, on the highest dose. And uh, of course, you can be, um, you know, uh, you can say, well, you know, it's not significant and that's it. But the study was actually not really powered to demonstrate um, an efficacy. 
uh, it was just to try to figure out what are the best outcomes um, and what is the best dose. And obviously, next development um, will focus on um, ambulant and six minute walking tests and the 450 mix dose. I have the next slide. And um, if you present the evolution of patients uh, of uh, what on placebo, that's the gray uh, and the dark green, as you may see, um, uh, seems to be improved, but of course, uh, it's small numbers and, and difficult to draw a, a final conclusion. Next slide. Um, then you can also act on neuromuscular junction um, because we know that neuromuscular junction is impaired in, in um, motor neurons. Next slide. There was a paper that, that was just published in, in neuromuscular disorders um, uh, that evaluate dalfamperidine um, in um, adult SMA patients. Um, the, the, actually, the, 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 the study was not really powered to demonstrate um, efficacy. Uh, next slide. And um, it was uh, uh, the, the difference um, between treated and untreated patients favored the treatment, but we, we were far away of, of um, something that is statistically significant. Next slide. There is also um, uh, another trial, which is uh, supported, sponsored by Biomarin of amifampridine, um, also in SMA type three. And it's um, a recent news that, that the phase two has, has been fully enrolled. Um, there is so far, um, to my best knowledge, um, no data that has been uh, communicated. Next slide. Um, and it's actually um, a crossover study, which means that patients are given um, the drug or the placebo, and then after a certain period of time, they switch. And, and this is, of course, feasible if you have a drug that is not supposed to have a kind of built-on effect in which is more, you know, immediate uh, and symptomatic effects. That's for the drugs that are currently in, in clinical development. Um, and then if we want to go and to look one step further, next slide. They are, um, next slide please. Um, so, so, some um, other possibilities, um, like for instance, it was observed that um, NCALD um, is, uh, uh, that, that, that patients who have an NCALD that is uh, um, decreased or inhibited in, 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 um, in the SMA may have a, a milder phenotype. And so inhibiting, inhibiting NCAL pathway in mice um, uh, leads to a minor but significant effect in strength and survival. Next slide. And, and the same apply for CHP1. Um, next slide. With also um, probably a more clear effect on, on strength and survival. Um, what is the potential of these drugs to, to reach a clinical development um, and to reach um, the uh, final uh, approval and reimbursement, actually nobody knows. And to be entirely honest, uh, clinical development are going to be more and more difficult in SMA because um, today it's impossible to conduct um, a double blind randomized placebo control study in patients who are untreated. So it means that um, uh, you have either to conduct a comparative study, which is very difficult, either to conduct an advanced study, um, which leads to increased um, variability that is related to when patients have started the, the first treatment, for how long are they on the first treatment, um, are they good responders with the first treatment, before even entering into the variability that is related to the add-on therapies. So at the end of the day, the uh, design of, of such trial is much more complex than a classical um, uh, double-blind randomized placebo control study when you don't have um, any other drugs that are approved. So is there really going to be many more drugs approved in the coming years? Actually, we don't know. Next slide. But I, I want to emphasize something, uh, which is, um, and, and this is really a choice that, that, that we have to make as a society. Um, we can further develop in SMA and we should further develop. But um, the best way uh, to achieve the final goal of not only treating SMA, but curing and making SMA disappear goes through um, newborn screening. 
And you probably know that newborn screening is um, actually a reality in 31 states of the United States, um, in two regions of Germany, um, in a region of Australia, um, in southern Belgium, in two regions of Italy. But if you look at the Europe, it's actually a very um, small percentage of patients who are screened nowadays. Next slide. Yeah, so that's the, the regions. Yes, next slide, please. Um, where where uh, today um, populations is screened, but, but as you might see in Europe, it's a very minor proportion um, of newborns uh, who are screened for SMA. Next slide. Nevertheless, um, you probably know this, this Belgian painting, so Cine pas une pipe, and, and which means that this is not a pipe. Um, it's a Magritte uh, picture. It means um, that actually images are sometimes just illusion. Um, this patient on, on, on the right um, is not a patient with SMA type 2. May I have the video? Is the, the first patients who have been screened. Um, could, could, could you start the video uh, of the baby? From the, yeah, yeah, yeah. He is the first baby who have been screened in southern Belgium. Um, and this baby um, has three copies of SMN2. He, he, he could have been an SMA type 2. Uh, I tell you that this guy is, is completely normal. As are more, um, all patients with three copies who have been treated before the symptoms, and as are 50% of patients who have, um, with two copies who have been treated before the symptoms. So, um, actually, there are regions of the world where SMA is disappearing. Um, and, and I think that the best way to conclude what's next in spinal muscular atrophy is yes, um, we can further develop. Yes, we can do better. Yes, probably um, adult therapy could help if we go to other targets. But the final goal, which is to make this terrible disease disappear, pass through newborn screening and early treatment. It's a constant finding across treatments and across development that if you want to be efficient, you have to treat at birth, immediately after birth, um, and before the symptoms, if you want to get a chance to have patients who are symptoms free. Next slide. <laughs> and um, this will conclude my, my uh, uh, lecture today. Um, and I, I want to thank uh, my teams uh, my previous team in Paris, um, the, the, the team of, of the newborn screening in Belgium on the right side and the team in Liège and um, our new team in Oxford uh, who is working hard to make also newborn screening happening in the UK. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Laurent. So we will um, move straight to um, Susan's presentation and then we'll have an opportunity for some questions at the end, if that's okay. Emma, can I get you to do the magic from your end? One moment. Thank you. Wonderful. Hello, today I'm giving you a research update on my work treating the brain and spinal cord with antibody oligonucleotide. My work is an extension from the very successful Nusinersen. Nusinersen enhances the quality of life for SMA patients. Over 10,000 patients have been treated so far. It improves ambulation, reaching of motor milestones, and reduces the need for permanent ventilation. Nusinersen is an antisense oligonucleotide, or ASO, and I'll talk about that in a second. All right, it doesn't look like the rest of the video is <laughs> happening here. <laughs> um, okay, how would you like me to, to proceed? I can if you just could, try to burp. Yeah, if you could carry on talking. What a shame, it was such a great video, but I'm sure you know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, uh, if, and, and if you just say next slide, Emma will be able to, to, to move you along. Okay, um, I'm trying to see here. Okay, oh, we have to stop because it's like a, it's going on as a video. I can also share my screen and do my presentation, if that works. I'll try one more time. Please bear with me. Okay. No, it doesn't want to do anything, does it? 
Oh, okay. Why don't you show your screen then, um, Susan, because then you can control the, the slides going forward. Okay, so I have a recorded version uh, here, and I will try to share my screen and see if it runs. If it doesn't, then I will actually use my voice, but my voice has been kind of in and out because of, uh, uh, it's because of a nursery cold. Um, I can't share my screen. Disabled participant screen sharing. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was so well planned. <laughs> Emma, could you go back to the slideshow, but just press it on, on the slides rather than on the recording? And then, yeah. and Susan, hopefully your voice will hold out. Um, <laughs> sorry about this, everyone. We we're always going to experience a few technical problems, and here we are. <laughs> so nicely done. Okay. Okay, can you see? All right, so, okay, so what I was trying to explain here is that uh, in all, all, bio all um, genetics and biology, uh, everything goes from DNA, which makes RNA, RNA, which makes protein. And what I'm trying to do is sort of describe what's happening with SMA. Um, and this is what happens with SMA. So you have a gene, which is survival motor neuron 2, and it makes the full length transcript and a fully functional protein. But it also makes a second transcript, a second RNA. And the RNA is not going to make um, a fully functional protein, but it makes a lot of this. So it's 10 times more of this is produced than the functional protein. But when we apply an antisense oligonucleotide to it, the antisense oligonucleotide binds to RNA during its processing. And the binding of the RNA during its processing changes the RNA machinery so that now it makes it more. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Okay, so it was just that slide that wasn't working. <laughs> Sorry, Four, everyone. Right. Where do you want to start from? Or should I just start from the... Um, I think that's the, the third slide that, that starts it working again. Um, I think I've described it up until that, so... Okay, right. Let's, let's try. When we... Oh, gosh. Yeah, right. Fingers crossed. Sorry, everyone. When we apply an antisense oligonucleotide to it, the antisense oligonucleotide binds to RNA during its processing. And the binding of the RNA during its processing changes the RNA machinery so that now it makes it more of this full length, fully functional SMN2 RNA and fully functional protein and less of the truncated RNA and non functional protein. Now, nucinersin, as successful as it is, does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so it has to be injected directly into the spinal cord through an intrathecal administration. So the work I've been doing has been focused on trying to get oligonucleotides across the blood-brain barrier so we can forego this sort of administration and do something a little bit nicer for patients. The brain is a heavily vascularized organ. Blood flows into the brain through the arteries, and gases and nutrients pass out of the blood and into the brain at these capillaries shown here in the upper right. Just below is a cross section of one of these capillaries. You can see that each blood vessel is surrounded by layers of cells, and these layers are what is called the blood brain barrier. Large molecules, like ASOs, cannot pass through these cell layers on their own. Large molecules can pass through the blood-brain barrier if they have something to help them get through. And one of these somethings is called a receptor. Now here I'm showing you a transferrin receptor. Now transferrin is a very common molecule that will carry iron into cells. And here transferrin is using the transferrin receptor to bind to the outside of the blood-brain barrier, and the transferrin receptor carries it through the cells of the brain barrier and out into the brain. So it is present in all the cells of the blood-brain barrier and at high levels, and it's also rapidly internalized. This is very interesting for us because our thinking is if we can get oligonucleotides to bind to this transferrin receptor, it can then be carried into the brain itself. However, oligos do not bind to transferring receptor. So we had to look in a little bit different. And one of these ways is using an antibody. 
Now, an antibody is a natural part of the immune system. It's produced by your white blood cells, called B cells. Um, and it naturally would bind to disease-causing bacteria or viruses to stimulate an immune response. However, because of these targeting elements here are very, very specific, scientists have used antibodies to re-modify them to target an array of different kinds of proteins and receptors. And here we're using one of these antibodies that can bind very specifically to the transferrin receptor. Now to carry the oligo with it, we've had to directly bind the oligo to the body of the antibody, but leaving free the ends that can bind to the transferrin receptor. And we used also, so on the left-hand side here is showing the antitransferrin receptor binding antibody. And on the right is our control antibody. Now our control antibody is identical to our transferrin receptor antibody except for the ends and the ends are non-binding controls so it doesn't bind to anything that would be present in the blood or the tissues of a mouse and we use these two antibody oligos for our studies now the first thing we wanted to see is are these actually passing through the blood-brain barrier and getting into the tissues we want it to get into and here we're looking at the spinal cord so this is a mouse that was treated with the antitransferrin ASO and comparing it to a mouse that was untreated. So we took out the spinal cord and did cross-sectional. Now in the upper left-hand panel is a motor neuron stained from an untreated mouse. And you can see here that the motor neurons are in red and there isn't really anything else you can see present there. Now the antibody ASO will light up in green if it's present. And in the bottom left-hand corner is a mouse that was treated with her antitransferrin ASO. And you can see there's really bright green markings in this tissue showing that we are getting this antibody ASO into the spinal cord. However, these green markings are not overlapping with the motor neurons, so they don't seem to be actually incorporating into the motor neurons. We also looked at astrocytes. Now astrocytes are helper cells for motor neurons and they're also part of the blood-brain barrier. So they're a very interesting cell to be looking into. And if you look in the upper right-hand corner, a mouse that has not been treated with anything has very nicely laid out red astrocytes and stained them red, but none of the green that we would see with an antibody. At the bottom right-hand corner, we see this wonderful overlap. The astrocytes are in red the transferrin antibody ASO is in green. And when they're in the same cell, when they're very, very close together, the cell sh shines as an orangey yellow. And where these arrows are sh showing is one of the many um, astrocytes within this tissue that are also showing an uptake in this antibody ASO. So it isn't present in the motor neurons of this case, but it is present in cells in the spinal cord. But then we wanted to look more generically at the whole brain. And the mouse brain is a bit different than the human brain. It has all the right parts, all the same parts, but it is laid out differently. So on the left-hand side is a schematic of what a mouse brain looks like. And on the right-hand side is a cross-section of our whole brain. It's been treated with the antibody transferrin receptor, ASO. Now, this brain is lit up green because that is showing us our antibody ASO. And very nice pockets of green are shown here in the cerebellum on the right hand, on the top right, on the top, on the bottom right, the pons, which is part of your brain stem, and then also in the thalamus in the central portion of the brain. These are particular areas that we saw really high um, expression of the antibody ASO. And just to show you that this is very specific, using our control antibody ASO, and this again is the whole brain, we weren't able to see the nice green patches that we were when we used the antitransferrin receptor ASO. So this was very, very specific for um, our targeted antibody. But we also did want to measure the amount that we found in the brain and spinal cord. So on the left-hand side here is the spinal cord. And this is different hours after a mouse was treated with IV administrations of the antibody ASO. In the pink is the antitransferrin receptor ASO, and in the black is our control antibody. So if we just look at the spinal cord, 
we can see that a few minutes after um, the treatment, we see about a 2% of the injected dose has gotten into the spinal cord per gram of the spinal cord. This goes up to roughly two and a half at 24 hours. In the brain, we're seeing something at about 3% uptake into the brain. This is really, really high for any kind of drug that you would treat systemically and then try to see how much is in the brain and spinal cord. So we're very excited about these results. So now that I can see visually that the antibody ASOs are getting into the brain and into the spinal cord, we want to see are these ASOs active. Now this is a slide I showed you previously of the effect of an ASO treatment on the amount of RNA and protein that's being produced. And what I'm going to do to look at activities, I'm going to measure the amount of RNA, of this full length RNA, that is present after treatment in tissues. Now, here I'm looking at the brain and the spinal cord. Now, this is animals that have been treated with a single IV administration of our antibody ASO, either the antitransferrin receptor ASO or our control antibody ASO. The antitransferrin receptor ASO is shown in red and the other is shown in gray. Along the bottom is either a saline treatment or dose escalating treatments so of 10, 20, 50, 80, or 100 mg per kg of the antibody ASO. And with the rising dose, you can see a rising activity level. The higher it goes means the more full length RNA is being produced. But it's only happening with our antitransferrin ASO. If I use our control antibody, it stays relatively flat no matter how much of this we're adding. We're also interested in looking at the other tissues of the body, and one of the tissues that's really important for SMA is the muscle. And here I'm showing you the tibialis anterior and the quadriceps. The tibialis anterior is what we call the shins, and I'm just giving you a schematic on the left of where those are located in the hind limb of the mouse. In both of these models, it was quite, in both of these skeletal muscles, I should say, it's quite interesting that we see an escalating dose affecting the expression of the full length RNA, but it doesn't seem to be very different between either our targeted antibody or our control antibody. And this is showing us that what we're seeing is a generic uptake of this compound into these tissues, but it's not specific for the transferrin receptor. So everything I've been showing you has been in SMA, and we're really keen to be looking in SMA, but this sort of technology has a lot of scope because anything that can get these antibodies into the brain and spinal cord without having to do the invasive intrathecal administration is going to be better for patients overall. So we're looking into neurological disorders and neuromuscular disorders to take this platform. I wanna give a massive thank you for Muscular Dystrophy UK who have supported my work and the work that we've done in the lab. Um, the members of AstraZeneca who's provided the antibody so far, so Carl Webster, Matthew Burrell, George Tom, and Ian Garrell. Um, the University of Oxford, Matthew Wood is uh, the head of our lab and my team, Larissa, Jessica, and Nina. And the chemists that were involved, Mike Gate and Frank Avendroff. Thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thank you, Susan, and apologies everyone for the slight technical hit at the beginning there. Um, we have got time for a couple of questions. We did have one um, submitted ahead of time, which was around um, SMA4. Now, clearly we've heard a lot of um, research and clinical trials and things are happening with SMA1 through 3, but Laurent, um, Susan, do you know of any studies that are happening um, for patients with SMA type 4? Um, no, I'm, I'm not aware, but, but it, it, it's not worthy that, that actually the, the label of the drugs that are approved today, um, the nurse and in, 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 in risk department in the US include, actually includes um, SNA type 4. So we, we are not at the level of, of clinical trials anymore. To share with you my, my personal experience um, with um, uh, type 4, the, of course, the, the more chronic is the form of SMA, the, the less spectacular or dramatic is the effect of the drugs. I mean, um, if you think about the SMA type 1, we're supposed to die without, within a couple of weeks and, and we acquire the sitting position. It's just transformative. If you go to a more chronic form, type 2, type 3, type 4, then, of course, things are much less um, impressive. Uh, using nursing um, for these patients, um, 
can can be burdensome because patients with type four mo most of time um, work are uh, um, you know uh, very active in, in in the society. So so when you have to stop to get your injection, then you may have backache or you, you may have a post lumbar uh, puncture syndrome. Then, then um, uh, nursing nursing can, can be um, burdensome, um, and uh, patients report improvement. They say, well, I, I feel, let's say, better, less fatigue, whatever, but it's difficult to quantify. It's very difficult to, to have an objective measure. So um, don't expect clinical trials in type 4 for several reasons. At first, if, if the effect is small, you need large population. Type 4 is rare. Um, type 4 is not a big market. So um, I think that, that the best question is not so much is there um, clinical trials, is, um, but much more um, would I be ready to go for the burden of a treatment? And if yes, then to have a look um, to the treatment that are available and, and approved today. Mm -hmm. And perhaps for f fatigue, you mentioned there, I mean, there may be other treatments that are not necessarily specific to SMA that would be for treating fatigue in, in patients with SMA type 4? Well, uh, this is, um, you know, f fatigue is, is something difficult. Huh? I mean, if I don't sleep tonight, um, um, I'll have fatigue tomorrow, um, yeah, but I don't have a muscle disease. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, I prefer to speak about fatigability or, or even to be more positive to speak about stamina. Um, so the, 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 the endurance. And, and, and um, in SMA, it, it's probably complex, but probably an important part of the, of the fatigability is related to neuromuscular junctions um, abnormalities. And that's probably um, a pool of patients for, for, for whom the neuromuscular junction, the drugs that act on neuromuscular junctions could, could be of interest, especially in the context of fatigue. Brilliant, brilliant, super. Um, there was a question that came in th um, through the live chat about, um, which has just disappeared in front of my very eyes. It was about the um, newborn screening and how, how close are we to, to newborn screening across Europe and, and what would be the sort of first line treatment for babies who are identified as, as having SMA? So um, it came quite as a surprise um, to me. Uh, we, we started in Belgium and in Germany um, two years and a half ago. Um, and it was so obvious that, you know, it's transformative. I mean, for, for two to three euros per baby, you make a disease disappear. Uh, it's just fantastic. Also in terms of cost, you know, when you see, when you know how, how much it um, cost the, 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 all the care of a patient with SMA, if you can avoid it, it's massively cost saving. So it, it was for me so obvious that, that, that newborn screening is the way to go, that it came as a surprise that, that actually outside the, the programs that were initiated immediately in Germany, in Belgium, and in, in, um, uh, two years later in Italy, things are not progressing super fast. And um, we are working out in the UK um, to start a pilot. Um, and I know that some colleagues are working out, but they are facing um, difficulties. And, and there are several kinds of difficulties. The first one is, is technical, because you, you need um, other equipment that for classical newborn screening. But it seems that, that it's main um, concept of uh, you know, private life uh, and looking at the, uh, the gene of people who, who, who makes things very complex in some countries. Um, and, and it seems that, that privacy could reside in, in, into the exon 7 of your SMA1 gene. Um, and then for in some countries, um, or some regulators, or some ethical companies, um, it, 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 it appears to be something, you know, uh, massively um, uh, spying people than just to have a look at the exon 7 um, um, of SMA1 gene in the newborn. So it's difficult. And, and there are countries in which it's super difficult. Um, UK is an example, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, what's next? What, what are the treatments? Actually, any treatment that's approved today, you you, uh, you could treat with gene therapy, but not patients with four copies, because the label in the, in Europe does not include patients with four copies who are non-symptomatic. Um, but you can treat um, all these patients with nursing. 
and they are still there's still a trial ongoing. It's called Rainbow Fish that includes patients, presymptomatic patients, um, for uh, um, uh, using uh, Rizdiplam. So th they are they are different possibilities today. Which yeah. one is the best? That's the five billion dollars uh, <laughs> question, but that's the right question because um, I mean that's that's how we will know if gene therapy actually um, um, gave a permanent uh, you know gene expression, and, and we will know it with with symptomatic patients. We'll need probably between ten and fifteen years, but we will know. Brilliant, thank you. There are a number of questions that have come through about um, access to um, treatments, which we might pick up on actually in the next in the next session. Um, so, just checking here, there was a question about: um, Could you explain how nusinersin and subsequent increase in protein helps a patient who's already symptomatic? For example, what is the best that can be expected in a ten-year-old SMA three patient who starts treatment? Well, this is an excellent question, actually. And and um, when we started using we were um, trials. We were we were sure that that at the very best we could stabilize patients, but not that patients will never improve. Um, how could it happen? And finally, they they, they do improve, um, including patients who are older. And 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 we we were quite surprised, to be honest, to see patients. Um, I'm not saying all patients, but some patients. Um, with a quite ad well advanced stage of the disease improving, um, and uh, there is no definitive question uh, um, uh, answer to this question. But I'll say um, maybe there is some sprouting of, of some axons, and maybe also there are motor neurons that are actually not death, but that are not working um, anymore because they are kind of kind of metabolism um, distress status, and then. Um, uh, allowing these motor neurons to re-express um, SMN protein can maybe help them to, to get out of this um, uh, uh, stress status and, 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 and working again. So that, that's, you know, <laughs> some of the explanation if you, if you don't accept that maybe there are ghost motor neurons that, that, that um, uh, appears um, in the spine. So, yeah, probably it's 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 the best explanation so far, but it has not been demonstrated. Okay, super. Well, <coughs> thank you both to um, Laurent and to Susan. As I say, there are some other questions. We're, we're not ignoring them. It's just I think that they're about access, and that will fit very well with the next um, the next session. And I also I'm aware that Laurent has to. Um, dash off he has another meeting um very shortly so um i don't want to get in trouble with those people um so thank you both so much for your time and for your um interaction and thank you to everyone who has um provided us with some questions that's been absolutely fantastic and um i know that i've learned a lot from, from this session already so thank you to to laurent and susan you're both incredibly welcome to stay actually Laurent you're not please go <laughs> but we, we will um we will move on to the to the next session now which is about um living with SMA and as I say we will be touching on the um the aspects of access to, to treatments as, as part of this session so we have a fantastic panel who I am um about to introduce um and just as a reminder Many people have already found the Q&A uh, section on Zoom, but do, do um, ask your questions through that se session section. So first of all, um, I'm going to um, introduce An Dr. Anne-Marie Childs, who's a consultant paediatric neurologist at Leeds Teaching Hospital's NHS Trust. Um, Dr. Childs leads the neuromuscular service there, which has rec is recognised as an MD UK Centre of Excellence. She's a principal investigator also on a number of clinical trials as well as delivering her, her clinical work um, and has worked with clinicians across the UK to ensure that equal access to research studies and to novel therapies for children and young people with neuromuscular conditions, irrespective of their social status or, or location. Also, I'd like to introduce um, Sue Manning, who's a neuromuscular specialist care advisor, also at the Leeds Teaching Hospitals NHS Trust. She was instrumental in the early development of the paediatric neuromuscular service and now she works as a specialist care advisor in a dedicated multidisciplinary service. 
Her current role entails offering advice and support to families affected by a neuromuscular condition right from the time of diagnosis through to transition to adult services. And this also includes, quite obviously, liaising with other professionals in the healthcare, education and social care settings. She's a, um, Sue's a member of our um, MD UK Services Development Committee as well. So welcome to Sue. Felicity Van is a um, Senior Specialist Paediatric Physiotherapist at the Evelina London Children's Hospital. Um, Felicity is work, working in a growing neuromuscular team there at the Evelina and they were awarded MD UK Centre of Excellence status last year. Felicity is um, involved in both neuromuscular research and in patient care and before she um, joined the Evelina in 2016 she's worked at Birmingham, Birmingham Children's Hospital and also at Bristol Children's Hospital. And finally on the panel is um, Rob Burley, who you've all met um, before, I'm sure many of you will have done, is Director of Campaigns Care and Support at MD UK. Um, he came to the charity in December 2018 and leads our services and campaigning work, which lead, um, includes our fast track to treatment work, um, which is the access to treatments, um, and he'll be speaking more about that. Um, so. I'm going to ask each of the, of the panel members just to um, say a few words and then we'll open up to, to questions. So um, Anne-Marie, maybe I can, I can turn to you first. It would be great to get a feel for the kind of support that a neuromuscular service like yours provides for people living with SMA and how treatment and support is guided by the SMA standards of care. And also, quite a lot of questions here, but I wonder if you've any particular aspect of your service has become more important to your patients as a result of the lockdown. Hey, hello everybody. Um, I think that, um, I think that you all know how important it is to have a multidisciplinary approach to your care and that whilst us doctors sometimes feel we're very important, we probably only provide a very small amount of what is really needed to make um, life at home and at school um, meaningful and to optimise the functioning of you or your child within your family. Um, and so we, we really depend very um, much on our team. Uh, and obviously that has a number of different members, both centrally in the Neuromuscular Centre, our care advisors, our specialist therapists, physios, OTs, um, our specialist nurses, but also those links with the community, because so often what actually happens out there is very different to what um, it, you think maybe should happen um, and what is possible given the restraints that people have in terms of funding and resources, which have been made so much worse um, by COVID and all the restrictions people have had with respect to shielding, both in terms of what you can do as individuals and families, but also what sort of support and help you can access. And I think I would say, I think we recognise that this has been a really, really difficult time uh, for those people living with chronic conditions. And I think that um, we've learned a lot more about uh, COVID-19 and how it might affect um, children, young people and adults with neuromuscular disorders. And I think at the beginning of this outbreak here, we were understandably incredibly cautious about how we advised you in terms of what you should and shouldn't be doing. And I think as time has gone on, we've begun to realise that um, shielding and being a lot I think we just lost. We just lose her, Marie. Sorry, here she is. Oh, there she is. Sorry. I don't know what happened there. Sorry. Um, just to say that decisions that you know we may need to be more tailored and more nuanced depending on the needs of the individual, uh, family and child. And I think that we've seen quite a lot of people become a bit deconditioned um, in terms of physical abilities since they've been at home. But we've also seen a lot of more social behavioural problems, a lot of um, uh, people with low moods. And I think that, you know, we really need now to look at how best to support people getting back out there. Obviously, it's not gone away, um, but, but there's a balance and we need to find that balance um, for, for individual people. And I've talked so long, I've forgotten what you, else you asked me. <laughs> Um, I think that covers a lot. We, I'm sure we will come back with more questions in, in a little while anyway, but thank you, Anne-Marie. That's, that's really important. I, and I think you're right. The, 
the thought of that balance is is I think critical for for, for people to to bear in mind. Sue, turning to you and your role coordinating the support that people living with muscle wasting conditions receive, um, can you tell us a bit about your role and the kinds of things you, you coordinate for families living with SMA? And again, I suppose, touch a little bit on how that things have changed over the last few months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'm a member of a, a, a national team. There's care advisors all around the country. Um, and we're all embedded in multidisciplinary teams. Um, some of us work with children and adults. Some of us just ch work with children. So I'm sure there'll be a care advisor um, around geographically where where families are that they can they can contact. Um, our role is generic. Um, we work as part of the multidisciplinary team. As as um, Anne Marie's already said, I'm I'm based at Leeds with our team here, um, and I don't work in isolation. We work together. That's the most effective way of working and helping and supporting families. Um, my role is very much about information sharing, support. From the time of diagnosis at Leeds, um, I share that role with our clinicians to um, give, give the diagnosis when, when, when we have found that and, and our children come to us for investigations. Um, and that involves a whole team. And then a lot of my role is about supporting families um, at that time, which is really challenging, really difficult. We're in a, a fantastic time now where we've got options for treatments, which we didn't have you know, years ago when I, was, I, I first started. However, it's still a trauma. It's still a difficult time. It's still um, hard to, to, to get your head around and think about, and there's an emotional impact on that. So, um, I hope that we support families around that time and, and, and then another big role is to then support other professionals that may not have come across children with SMA before. For us, um, you know, it's common and we see a lot of children and, and that's the beauty of having a national um, network and, and, and being able to use all that knowledge and, and gain those skills. But for many other teachers or um, nursery staff or you know health visitors GPs they may not have that knowledge so that's a part of the role as well to to be available and, and inform and support those other professionals whether it's in education social care um, you know in the voluntary sector wherever that might be to support families and um, from the diagnosis onwards um, I think it has it has been very challenging with with COVID our work patterns have changed tremendously. A lot of my work was actually out there in the community with families and visiting them at home. Um, initially that all had to stop. Um, now we are starting to visit again, but of course we have to wear PPE. That's the difference that we're dealing with. And in a clinical setting, we are able to see patients now face to face on a priority um, basis, but again, you know, little ones coming in, seeing us all masked up and with 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 all the gear on, is is not how we normally work and not how we like to work. But uh, so so that there's been changes there. Um, I think I'm also very aware that families, um, there's been holdups with things. You know, things like going for orthotics appointments if there's been orthopedic appointments. Um, they've all the those have have stopped um, and. And that's been a challenge, social services assessments for direct payments. Um, all those things have, have slowed down because we're working in a different way and that's had an impact certainly on families. And I think the general now, initially the anxiety is about shielding, what are we doing, etc. And now of course we're, we're approaching the next stage of reintegration phasing into back into school back into society which brings other worries and concerns and 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 a big part of our role is to keep up to date give families information about that so hopefully that they will feel um reassured and and we can we can work at a pathway forward for them to children to be getting back into nurseries and schools brilliant thank you and and felicity um to my mind, physiotherapy feels like it should be quite a hands-on kind of activity. And, and so I guess that your, your role and your, your way of working has changed considerably, although I do see you've got your scrubs on. So I guess you are also in the clinic as well. 
Yeah, totally. I mean, just to give me an example, you an example of today, I spent the first two hours seeing an urgent face to face patient and I've had uh, a virtual clinic for the last four hours with my headset on trying to assess children over video. And I definitely didn't sign up for physio thinking I'd be doing it without putting my hands on. It's, it is a hands-on job and I am learning definitely. So I think one thing I'd say is to the families, please bear with us. We're all learning to use the equipment. We're learning to try and get the most we can from our assessments, but we still, I think the whole of the MDT are still out there trying to get the most we can for sort of, all our SMA children and their families. It's just possibly been made a little bit harder for us for the moment. One of the key things a lot of our families have been concerned about, I think, was the sort of the risk of maybe us assessing them and not seeing their full potential or seeing the proper assessment, being able to complete those assessments. Because we, we're often the key person who completes the majority of the, the assessment that will actually mean they sort of are applicable for the managed access agreement for Newton nursing and whether they can continue or whether they show a decline and we have to show sort of document that and I think the key thing to say is that we have there's been a lot of work gone on really early doors um, which I know a lot of um, people have been involved in to help people with video assessments but also to make it realize that we won't sort of make any changes based it has to be based on hands-on assessments so if we think someone's deteriorated we will bring them in if we think anything has changed we're seeing face-to-face -face patients like i said today um i'm not seeing them like i normally would um we have slightly fewer clinics we're trying to we have the through flow in the hospital is less we are seeing majority of patients still still on video and virtual but if we need to see them because something has changed or parents have concerns or the children have concerns we can bring them in it just might look a little different our outpatient clinics are running sort of in a there's no waiting room so people can't wait around they can only come with one parent with them and i think like sue mentioned all the ppe i'm wearing scrubs as you saw so um i've got scrubs and then i wear a face mask and a eye shield uh gloves and apron for everyone i see and our patients and parents also wear face masks uh, mm -hmm. as soon as they step foot in the hospital if there are any we also sort of understand that it's some of those things that we have put in place make it quite difficult for families to come in so if they need to have both family members with them that's something that we can approach and talk about because that's one of the things we've also had questioned but all we're, we're still continuing all our assessments and as, as the physios we do the the chop and tend for our sort of non non-sitting children with sma and we've got the hammersmith assessment all of those assessments and the sort of upper limb assessment looking at function and trying to as much as we can in physio help and support families, empower those children to get the best that they can with what is really frustratingly a, a, not a great diagnosis. And I sort of had to have this discussion this week with a new SMA type one family, but trying to explain that we now don't know where, where we're aiming for. So we just keep going with physio now. They, we have all, all, all the SMA ones I know are sitting all of the sort of with, we've got type twos under treatment who are like we said we didn't expect them to improve we expect them to stay static but they're showing some improvement there's lots of things happening and sort of i think that is really exciting for me i had a, a video consultation with one of my type ones who is in his standing frame and popping popping bubbles and that's it's really something i you know you wouldn't expect to see but we also see new challenges and i think that's the other thing with physio is we need to be aware that the type ones are now uh, new phenotype type ones and we are have to be hot on that and help sort of helping the local teams who maybe haven't seen so many children who have new nursing and realize that they have other alongside the fact that they might be able to sit they now have a higher risk of a curvature to their spine so thinking about spinal jackets we might want we want to get them up into standing like i said so we need to think about other orthotics there's lots of things and i think we as physios need to be really aware of that and trying to educate and sort of help the families and children understand what, what is possible. And we don't even know what's possible at the moment and we just keep working with, with everyone to try and get, get the most we can. Yeah, thank you. It sounds like there's a, um, a lot of ad adaptation going on all around for so many reasons, some of which obviously COVID related, perhaps not really what anyone would want, but because of the changes with the treatments and the opportunities, that's a, that's a really great, exciting adaptation um, that has to be made. So that's fantastic. Great. Thank you so much. And, and Rob, moving to you, I mean, as we're sort of talking about that the, the Spinraza is available um, 
at least in theory to, to people across the UK um, and there are a number of treatments kind of coming along in the on, on the horizon can you give us an overview of these and perhaps tell us a bit about how MD UK is involved in, in seeking to secure access to those that are on the horizon? Yeah, thanks, Kate. I think the, the, the curse of going last on the panel is that I, I, I just want to ask Anne-Marie, Felicity and Sue more about what they've just said, because it was fascinating. And Felicity, thank you for entering your fifth hour of Zoom with us. That's pretty, um, pretty committed. So, yeah, I'll, um, I'll give a run through of kind of the, where we're at with access to, to treatments. And a lot of this are, are treatments that were referred to in to already so I'll, I'll try and whiz through so I'm going to cover three so starting with with Spinraza which is which is also known as, as Nusi Nursing so this is the only licensed and reimbursed treatment in the UK for SMA which is a technical term that means it's available through the NHS and that's an important point to hold on to as we discuss the treatments that I'll, I'll come to um, and it was appro approved primarily after sort of clinical trials and um, showed significant improvement in, in motor function and, and um, this is just kind of run through some of those there and um, it's administered through an injection into the spinal canal which is um, called a, an intrathecal injection um, and access to spin rasa um, has been a major focus for our campaigning efforts at MD UK um, working in partnership with individuals and families living with SMA and with other patient groups and indeed with with, with clinicians and, and care advisors etc because um, I think that's a really, a really important message from Today is the partnership across the, the SMA community, but also the, 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 the broader sort of muscle wasting community. So in Scotland, um, Spinraza has been routinely available to children who have SMA type 1 since May 2018. Um, and since July 2019, it's also been available to people with SMA types 2 and 3 under the Ultra Orphan Pathway, which is a, a system in Scotland for um, treatments for very rare diseases. And that's initially for a period of, of three years. In England, um, access to Spinraza is available through what's called a managed access agreement, which I think is a term we've, we've heard already this afternoon, or, or an MAA. And, and that means that people can receive the treatment while more data is gathered on the impact that it, that it has on them. So, so a, a trials have shown it to be um, a, a, a kind of a, a very effective treatment and a safe treatment, um, and, but the, maybe perhaps the patient size, is, the sample size isn't isn't huge so the MAA allows patients to to receive an effective treatment whilst data is still gathered so uh, that MAA in England was approved in uh, or began in July 2019 and is set to run for five years um, and MD UK is one of three patient groups on the managed access oversight committee so a lot of kind of um, terminology to go our heads around but um, that, that being on that committee basically allows us to monitor the progress of the rollout which I'm, which I'm conscious we may get questions on because we are aware of particularly with with COVID that sort of rollout has stalled and, but it also play a part in ensuring that um, the sort of necessary data is, is being collected and um, I think with with Spinraza it's important to kind of note that under the MAA so people with SMA types one, two, and three can receive Spinraza unless they're on permanent ventilation or haven't been ambulant for more than 12 months. Um, and their clinician must also assess that they, the necessary spinal injection is possible. That's particularly in the case of people who have had spinal um, procedures in the past. Um, when the MAA was, uh, was, was announced last year, um, there was a it was it was with mixed a mixed response or mixed views because we 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 and other groups have pushed for, for wider access and I think it's important to note that there is still a possibility for access to widen further within the period of the MAA, um, particularly to people with type three SMA who are non-ambulant and and that really rests on the manufacturer of Biogen submitting further evidence. So again, we 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 have regular discussions with with the manufacturer along with the other patient groups and um, to sort of check in on them and I know they're very keen to keep to bring that evidence forward so that more people can start to receive. Um, Spinraza. Um, I note that kind of in, in Wales and Northern Ireland, access to Spinraza has, 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 has largely aligned with, with, with England, even though the, set, the, um, the systems are, are separate. Um, and I think it's sort of interesting to hear the, the, the panel's views, but sort of rollout of the treatment it is underway, like I say, and it has, it has been delayed in places because of COVID, but it's probably slightly more advanced for children simply because um, there were systems in place within sort of paediatric services for, for the administering of the treatment to, 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 to type what babies with type, type 1. Um, and a kind of key message um, I give throughout this really is that if, if you if you think you should be receiving a treatment or an aunt, then certainly speak to your clinical team first, but definitely get in touch with, with us via the helpline or via our e email service so we can keep sort of track of that because a key role that we play as a patient group is to um, sort of flag areas where there may be, may be an issue. 
I'll sort of move on to to Risdeplan, the sort of second treatment, which again we've, we've we've heard mentioned. So that may well be on people's minds because there was a significant development last week um, around this treatment. So Risdeplan is an oral treatment for SMA, which means that it doesn't require a, a spinal injection. So a, a marked difference there to Spinraza. Um, and last week, the company that manufactures the treatment, Roche, uh, announced that its application to the European Medicines Agency had been validated. Um, and I was very careful to emphasize that word because it doesn't mean it's, it's been approved. Um, so it's been validated, which means it's now kind of starting to assess the treatment at that level. And as a result of that, though, the, sort of the key thing last week was that Roche announced an expansion of what's called a compassionate usage program or, or a CUP across the UK. And that's a way in which treatments can be made available um, to people, even though even sort of the pre-approval, and while they're still administered by clinicians, it's the drug company rather than the NHS um, that pays for the treatment. So that sort of loops back to that point I made about Spinraza, in that that's the only uh, currently Spinraza is the treatment that's reimbursed and approved. Therefore, that's the NHS will will seek to, to administer it, Spinraza. So kind of the first port of call. Um, but under the expanded CUP, if Spinraza is not clinically suitable for someone with type one or two SMA, so that might be because the um, they can't receive the necessary spinal injection, or COVID nineteen has led to someone's um, Spinraza treatment being interrupted, their clinician can now apply direct to Roche to begin treatment with with Risteplan, which is which is really sort of significant development. Um, currently, under the terms of the CUP, people even the expanded CUP. Um, people with types three or four SMA can't receive risk plan, but this doesn't mean that, that they won't be able to in future. And it certainly isn't an indication um, of the availability that will be applied for the applied for as the treatment sort of enters the nice process, which we, we think is due to start so in, the, in the autumn. Um, and certainly working with part and um, it's quite a complex issue. So working in partnership with the other SMA charities, we've published a comprehensive Q and A on our website um, that's been checked for accuracy by by Roche, and we'd recommend having a look at that uh, through our website and then discussing with your clinician if you think you you, you should be able to receive Risteplan um, because they're the kind of, they're the, they're the group that will um, work with you and, and apply to, to Roche if they think you are eligible. Um, and then the final treatment I'll touch on is Zolgensma. So Zolgensma is a gene therapy treatment being developed by the pharmaceutical company Avexis and it's designed to replace um, the faulty or missing SMN1 gene to limit the progression of SMA. Um, the clinical trials are ongoing um, and earlier in the summer NICE announced that the treatment is set to be discussed at its October committee meeting and we'll be working with with other SMA charities before that and it's kind of a, um, sort of reflecting back on some of the other panelists comments about the impact of COVID we saw a kind of a hiatus in um, NICE uh, uh, the NICE approval process for various treatments not just for SMA but various other treatments that we're involved with at MD UK um, but what's positive is that those all appear to have sort of be restarting. So we've got quite a busy autumn um, ahead of us. Um, so kind of final word on access to treatments. We're committed at MDUK to fight for swift and wide access to new treatments that, as they're developed. And we'll work in partnership with people living with SMA and with other patient organisations as we continue to fight for that. And if you do have any issues with access, do please contact us because um, that will, A, help us identify any problems across the country, but secondly, helps us to build a picture that we can sort of um, sent back to decision makers and to, and to drug companies um, and really kind of the partnership bit is, is key for us so really as throughout all of our work we work very closely with 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 everyone who we can including people like Felicity Sue and, and Anne-Marie just to really kind of emphasize the impact on, on patients and, and the need for these treatments to become available as, as quickly as possible. Great thank you so much Rob and um, we have had um, an, a number of, of questions kind of coming through so um maybe we can we can touch on those i mean some of them relate actually to this this access um issue around access rob um and when people with type 3 might be able to access Ristoplam, and, and and a number of people have sort of put comments on the um q a about you know access has been delayed and partly because of covid and and you know what 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 do what do we advise and maybe i don't know Anne marie whether you want to, to come in and say something on that I mean, I think I think this is really difficult because I think it's this. Um, obviously, it's great to be working in a field where we've now got potentially three treatment options, and and none of us would have imagined we'd be here five, ten years ago, really. So, so it is a fantastic time. But now we're at this really tricky moment where there's a lot of excitement and a lot of expectations about what that means, but it's not really translating yet into effective treatments for individuals and um and that's really tough 
Um, and I think that the bureaucratic processes are pretty laborious um, and it feels as if they take much longer than, than we think they should. Um, but that's partly around safety and trying to make sure that um, these treatments are, are reasonably effective and justifiably used within our kind of healthcare system. And I think one of the big challenges is going to be how we determine which particular treatment a particular individual has. Um, and some of that will be determined for us by the way in which the approvals process works. Um, but there will still be situations where there may be a bit of flexibility. I think that the um, issue around Spinraza, I think that there are some real issues for certain groups. I feel particularly passionate about the um, exclusion of type 3 a patients because I, I don't think there's really much sort of biological justification for that and I really hope that we can give the data uh, via Biogen to the uh, nice panel who are reviewing this and we can get that resolved. Similarly for, for adults, um, I mean we shouldn't be thinking about age as being a kind of determinant of whether you get treatment. There may be other factors that, that mean the treatment's going to be more or less effective in an individual. I think the other thing I would say is that the real world experience is a little bit different to clinical trials because clinical trials have patients who are really closely selected with a very defined pattern of ability and in the real world it's not like that. Um, and I think that, you know, I think from my experience of treating our cohort of patients, most of whom are actually later on set SMA, um, we've seen some people have really dramatic responses, a 10 year old as, as per the question that somebody's put on the, um, on the website. I, you know, we, I was just looking at the data from one of our 10 year olds, he's had five injections, who has had dramatic improvements in his scores, um, who, who really seems to have responded well to treatment. And then there are other children that don't seem to have had the same effect and it's very difficult to predict beforehand how an individual child young person or adult might respond to treatment and I think that there's still a bit of a gap in the data we're collecting around quality of life and how these things that we're measuring as part of the manage access agreements translates into to meaningful differences for for individual people and people are working on this but we need to get that right because that's really important for for NICE and the regulators to understand um, mm. about what actually influences your quality of life um, so, but I think that one of the, the difficulties around things like the compassionate use program is that it seems like a good solution for anyone who hasn't been able to get in and have their nurse and nurse in treatment. Um, but, you know, the truth is we don't have the same data about Rizdaplan. We don't, we don't have the same number of people who've been treated. So it's really quite difficult as, a, as an individual trying to make that decision, as well as us in the sort of professional side of being able to really advise families about what is best. And, and there will continue to be uncertainties and frustrations, I think, around this for some time. And I think it's, as you say, it's really important that we're all working together to try and understand the complexity of these issues and to try and frame that in a way that the regulators and people who are providing access to treatment can understand. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I think that's important. And, I, and you know, as, as Rob said, to if you are having challenges um, locally to, to get access to treatment, do let us know through our, our helpline just so that we can we can work with um, we can work with NICE, we can work with the doctors to, to sort of see how, how best we can um, really overcome this at a, as a more global level rather than perhaps sometimes in the individual level so that people can can find out what works. Anne-Marie? So I, I should have said that really I mean I think that we are aware that there are some services that are relatively under-resourced under in parts of the country and that's really tough for families. Yeah. I think that we have um, we have worked together reasonably well within the SMA network um, and the, Re the REACH network to try and support people from different regions. And we've certainly taken on some treatment for people. Um, and I know other, other centres have obviously, London often is a first point of call, but I know that we've done that um, mm -hmm. and Newcastle have. So, so there, there may be a way, so don't uh, yes. get in touch and we can see, but not necessarily with the individual centre, but, but uh, if you get in touch, then we can do that through the network. Brilliant, thank you. 
we have a couple of questions that relate more to sort of physiotherapy um and so one of them say it was um do spinal jackets compromise the breathing for sma type one at all felicity i guess that's we tend to right. find um all of our all of our type ones will need a jacket and they because we are now encouraging them to sit and i would really recommend that you don't do any sitting until you have a jacket because you haven't got the spinal control and your spine is at a real risk of curvature and we have to bear in mind that these are the children as well with the higher sort of risk of respiratory problems and if you look at their breathing pattern it is quite effortful and most of our I'd say most all of most to all of our SMA type ones are needing ventilation of some sort and a cough assist to support them with this. They all will have spinal jackets and they all manage okay. Um, I do know that some people find it difficult to find the jacket the fit to fit right. And if they're particularly unwell, the jacket stops being worn from a respiratory side of things. The way we have found it easier, um, if they do have sort of quite an effortful work of breathing, is we um, cut a hole or in sort of a to allow more breathing and more diaphragm movement. So the jacket supports all the way around. It's hard plastic and it has a hole around the sort of tummy area, which actually is also quite good for the children who have pegs and things as well. And we don't, doesn't mean that that's how the jacket will always be, but definitely we have, um, let's say, some, most to some of our tight ones will have that to allow that breathing and allow the sort of expansion of their diaphragm. The, I have to say, I think it's usually fine. I've had a few local physios ask me. We tend to try, like to manage all of our patients' spinal jackets here because it is a little bit more complex. And then we ask, we don't ask the local teams to manage them. But sometimes they can and that's fine. But it's just if there is anything complicated, we're really happy to take that on with our orthotics team. Brilliant. Thank you. Again, it's adaptation, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, brilliant. And there's another question regarding physio from, from an older person who says that now that they are older, they really need physio um, advice from someone who understands about SMA and that they've been asked by um, or suggested that they get their PAs to help, which obviously is a quite dangerous thing to, to do. So do you know who they could reach out to or so i think it's it's yeah it's tricky because i'm i'm in pediatrics but i do sure. know that half of my children transition to areas where there are neuromuscular physiotherapists in the clinics some of them transition where there are not even in the specialist centers they don't have neuromuscular physiotherapists and so a lot of them are striving to get them but also whether there's even physiotherapists locally, I'm fully aware it's a bit of a postcode lottery and I, it's, it's frustrating that, that that's something that can be offered throughout. Answering the sort of saying that getting the PAs to do it would be dangerous. I actually disagree with that because I spend most of my time educating um, carers and support workers who look after children and I educate, I, I educate them uh, to how to do the exercises and how to do things. And, expect this child and the carer or the family to take that on board and they're not an, they're not a qualified physiotherapist but they they get the advice from ourselves and they know sort of as and when to stop and what to do however if it is something specific I do understand it's difficult I think if someone really the, the first port of point of call is the GP always because the GP should know what's available in the area and that's what you as an adult that's what you have to do to get physiotherapy the other thing is if you want to pay privately it's really important to know that your physiotherapist is actually sort of uh, registered in the healthcare professions council and is is a sort of actually legitimate physiotherapist and you, what you can do is you can we have a um, something called the, Ch the Chartered Society of Physiotherapists, CSP. And if you type into Google CSP physio and the number two, you, and it will, you can type in your area and the speciality and it will tell you um, all the physios in that area that work in private areas. And you can, you could approach them for a, a one-off session if that was what you wanted and you were able to pay for that. I can understand it's not, I, I wish I didn't have to say you have to approach private, but I think sometimes that is an option. And sometimes there is something in the area that you might not know about as well, that your GP might be able to link you in with. So I hope that helps. Brilliant. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll take a note of, of, of that as well and be able to put, um, the, the opportunity for people to look locally to see what what is available to them i think that'd be very helpful super we also had some questions that kind of came in in advance of the um the call and I'm, I'm mindful of time but um there's a question about when how and when people with sma type 3 will be able to access um, risk plan rob i don't know whether you're able to to answer that one 
thanks, thanks, Kay. I think um, there's no um, no definite time scales yet. I think keen to reiterate that whilst at the moment it's only available to um, so some people with types one and two, um, that that isn't an indication that, that that's what the kind that that's the group that will be um, the treat will be sought for as as Ross entered the sort of nice process as we work with with other um, patient groups. So it's something we're really aware of, and we, we want to provide an update on as, as soon as possible. So we'll keep people posted, and what, what we try and do is coordinate with other patient groups so that there's a kind of unified message going out to the community. And I think it's really important that we we, we try and do that. So n no sort of firm date, but we'll keep people posted, particularly um, as more details are released about um, entering sort of the nice process and. And having what is received EMA approval. Brilliant, super. Thank you. There, there's a comment around um, people, older people, perhaps wanting to get some 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 form of treatment um, sooner rather than later, and that, that testing and safety is not a priority. Um, I, I, I guess that's something that is is a very difficult one. I mean, Anne Marie, I don't know whether that's something you can you can comment on from a sort of clinical perspective. I mean, I, I completely understand uh, why people would feel like that. Um, I think that there is hopefully some movement around improving access to new to nurse and treatment uh, for adults. And um, I hope that that will be expanding. Um, I think there's definitely a sort of recognition that the MAA should, should be expanded for new to nurse and treatment. The difficulty is, as you've said, that adult services haven't really been set up to work in the same way as children. They often don't have the, the broader multidisciplinary team that you need in order to, to monitor things along the kind of conditions that we have in the managed access agreement where people have to be enrolled in the SMA REACH uh, uh, observational study. They have to have six monthly detailed physio assessments. Um, and that's that's been difficult for quite a few of the adult services to provide. But I think they are thinking about that. The other issue, obviously, is that um, repeated lumbar puncture is not uh, not necessarily um, something can be approached easily. It's technically sometimes more difficult in adults. It's more burdensome having to physically come to hospital, particularly around the loading doses. But um, I, you know, I, I think that as people st see how that translates into benefit, then I think hopefully it will become clearer about how we should think about treating different people with at different stages of their illness, really. But um, as ever, we kind of need more data, but we need that data in the real, real world. So I guess we have to hope that there's maybe, I mean, there is talk about looking at other strategies to to allow access to RISD plan through something like an early access to medicine scheme, uh, which I know the company are, are looking at exploring and that, that may um, open up other opportunities. I mean, I think that, you know, in a sense, the unmet need perhaps is sitting in that group really now because other people can at least access some treatment. So, yeah. you know, I think that's a point we need to make to mm. the regulators and also to the pharmaceutical companies who are looking to to try and uh, get the regulators to, to support us. Brilliant. Super. Now then, I am very mindful of the fact that it's now just turned half past. So maybe if I can speak to all of our, ask all of our panellists, just if they've got sort of one final comment that they would like to make. And maybe Sue, sorry, we, we haven't had questions coming your way, but maybe if I can sort of leave a final comment from you. That's fine. Um, I think... I'm thinking of the future. Um, coming out of COVID, we've got some really exciting times ahead with the treatments. Um, but short term, I, I'm thinking about how we start to get back to an equilibrium again and that people feel confident to start to go back to school education work um, out into the community and, and supporting them with that. Brilliant. Thank you. Anne-Marie? I think I would echo that. I think it's really important that we help people reintegrate back into, into society. I think it's really important that we work together to continue along the, the theme I, you mentioned at the beginning of my introduction. That I really feel strongly that we can't be in a situation where people who live in different places or come from different parts of the community are, are less likely to get treatment. So I, I feel quite strongly that we need to work together to ensure that doesn't happen. Brilliant. Thank you. Felicity. I think just I want to I sort of again we all echoing the same things but just to say sort of 
we know it's scary trying to get back out there if you have been shielding and I think it's really important to if you've got any questions or concerns or worries about it to approach your local team your specialist team ask people about it so that actually we can support you to try and get sort of getting everyone back out and integrating back into doing what they need to be doing and sort of actually enjoying life which is really important and hopefully we can all get back to a, a more of a normal normality soon and get back to seeing everyone as we normally would but in the interim we'll uh, keep supporting you virtually as much as we can thank you super and, and rob over to you that's okay yeah i would i think just two things have sort of really struck me as, as, as the conversation sort of unfolded i think so sort of firstly in response to sort of points that um sort of Am Amory raised I, it, it's fascinating the, the role that patient groups like MDG UK have when it comes to um, sort of seeking approval of, of treatments. And it's really important that we work alongside um, uh, clinicians and, and, and services to um, help keep the community informed about um, you know when there is a headline announcement about an approval of a treatment, what that actually means for the for when that may become available and, and, the, and the complexities. Because you know, I, I think I've already summed it really well. Just all the moving parts that have to happen. Um, you know, for, for, for a drug to, to become available e even after it's been approved. And I think the second thing, sort of building on a point for this to be made about just the importance in, of, of specialist sort of physios and other roles sort of linked to, linked to new muscular services, including in care advisors, I think kind of something that I'm, I'm really proud of um, in the UK is our role in helping um, secure specialist roles across the, across the country, across the UK, um, working in partnership with services where there is a gap. And, and I'd, sort of, I'd encourage people to, to come to us if they if they if they can't access something like a care advisor or if there is a gap in specialist physio because we've we've got quite a strong track record I think we secured across the country eleven specialist roles last financial year I think our kind of running total is that thanks to the campaign that we've done since 2013 I think it's about 6.9 million pounds of investment for the NHS has gone into new muscular services that that wouldn't have been there had we not worked in partnership with services to do things like build a business case and, and make a strong sort of submission to to, to resourcing sort of authorities and things so. Just, yeah, thank, thank, thank you so much, because that was interesting how those points kind of rose out of the SMA discussion, but they kind of apply across, I think. Super, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you to our panellists. Unfortunately, that's the end of today's session. Um, I'd just like to thank you all, Felicity, Sue and, and Anne and Marie, for your, for your time and, and commitment to um, this session. We really appreciate it. And, and hopefully people have found it informative and, and useful. Um, thank you to all the people who have submitted questions and, and partaken of the of the discussion. Um, we will be record. Oh, we have the recording. This we will be putting the um, video up. Um, hopefully within the next twenty four hours, um, and we'll be in touch with a um, short survey for people so that we can get some feedback as to um, how how the how the session went. Um, one final thing, I'd just like to reiterate again that we're very grateful to Sorecta Therapeutics for supporting the um, Muscles Matter online seminar series um, through their generous sponsorship. But um, that's all from us for this session. So thank you all so much and um, have a good afternoon. We may see some of you later. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you.